Howdy. Howdy. Well, you all made it back. That's good. Got an interview? Who are you going with? Okay. All right. Last time we had done beam base plates. Is that right? Is that what those were called? Beam base plates? Beam bearing plates. Column base plates. That's correct. Because a column has a base. So it needs a base plate underneath it so that it won't overstress the concrete. A beam's got ends on it. It's got reactions. It does need to bear against the concrete also. But it's not a base plate. They're done differently. The main difference is when you have a column pushing down on a steel plate sitting on a piece of concrete, the bending, I'll show you in a minute, occurs. These corners tend to wrap up in one direction, and these corners or these sides tend to wrap up in the other direction. That's two-way bending. Whereas if you have a beam with a bearing plate underneath it on a piece of concrete, I really should have shown you an end view. They don't sit that way. End view. They tend to wrap up these little sides of the plate tend to curl up just in one direction, one-way bending instead of two-way bending. So it gets a little more complicated. This is the equation that we derived. It's in your manual on page 4-16. It's in one of the pages that you and I just did. It's used for being, uh, plate bending of any kind. <clears throat> if you got a plate that hangs out a dimension L, you'd have to decide what you think L is. If you think L starts right about here uh, at a distance K, then how much it hangs out, that was L. Two times the load carried by the plate through the column or through the beam. And divided by, there was our phi in the equation, 9 tenths. B times N, that was the area of the plate, and then uh, yield stress. So go back and check the derivation. It's actually good for any plate that's got a little cantilever hangout on one or two or one or more sides. The piece of view in the equation is merely your request for load coming in. The stress that would be underneath the plates we're working on now would be the total load divided by the size of the plate, base times N. If you remember, a lot of my notes had N in the, in the beam bearing plate stuff. Because in the older codes, here's the concrete. In the older codes, they call this in in a beam bearing plate. And they called this in in a column base plate. And then people were getting confused. And so they said, well, okay, let's just call, let's change the name of how far this goes back from in. We'll change it to the length of the bearing plate. And that's what caused the change in the notes. The equation is the same. Sometimes you'll see this stick out cantilever length brought outside just as L. As long as your plate's thicker than that, it will be acceptable. The, you know, I did say that was not in the manual, and that was true about five editions ago. And uh, it is in the manual. Thank you. So write it down anyway. I remember that now, yeah. Page 4-16. Is that right? Did I get the wrong page number? Probably off an old manual, too. Uh, let me see somebody got, you got, let me see a book a minute. It's in the, 
It's in the bearing plate stuff. Well, I'll fix that. I thought it was 416. But you ought to see a... It ought to have this equation right here somewhere around there. All right. So, check that. Old book. and But not old, so old they don't have it. At least I know I saw it in there. I know it's in there. All right. Now then, first off, you got to know how long these little cantilevers are. How long these little cantilevers are, you probably would think, well, the little plate underneath this wide flange hangs out this much. But what we really find is there's so much moment right in there that it actually bends a little further back than that. So they make you say that the thing hangs out M. But to get M, you take the total dimension N of the plate, you subtract the depth of the beam, you divide the both of them by 2 so that you have this dimension here, and then you back off a little back into the flange of the wide flange. 0.95D is how far it backs up on for both sides. So we'll see an equation for M in a minute. We would say that N cut in half divided by D cut in half, minus D cut in half, but you only want this dimension so that you're back into the uh, flange a little bit. As far as the width is concerned, you might think, well, the, the little cantilevers pretty much come out from the tip of the web. But even then, there's so much moment that it actually pries underneath that a little bit. And in this region in here, the little cantilevers are probably even longer than that to some extent. So they make you bring the back of the cantilever, the fixed point of the cantilever, back so that this dimension is point F times the flange width. So that would be B over 2 minus uh, 8 tenths of uh, 4 tenths of the wide flange. That puts it back in here somewhere. It makes it a little longer. It makes it a little thicker. Now back to where I've got all my pictures and things. Here's your concrete footing. Here is your column base plate. Here are your little pieces hanging out. There's your steel wide flange as seen from the top. There was one last note on this page. You have it. It's on a different page. Back when we were doing the reactions and getting those reactions into the web, sometimes you have concentrated loads on the top of the column. It can get to be a problem once you put a concentrated load, I'm sorry, of your beam. You can put a concentrated load on there, and this thing sometimes is so tall and so thin that it will buckle, and in which case J10.4 and J10.5 tells you how to analyze that. If they say, okay, that's not a good design, you fall within the region of you got to do some more stuff, then you'll have to brace that top flange. Here are the little curls up on these things. Here it is seen in elevation. Here's the web. There's your flange. There's the cantilever starting back under the flange somewhat. It's your job to take D times 0.95. And then what's left is how much it hangs out on both sides. And so you're going to be looking for that cantilever length. That's N minus 0.95D. And then there's one on both sides. That's M. Then looking at it the other direction, rather than bending about the flange, which is this line right here, bending about this line, they ask you to take B minus 0.8 times B sub F, width of the flange, and then 
Make that your cantilever length. So N would be equal to B minus 0.8. There's two of those things, one on each side, divided by two. That's how long that cantilever hangs out. The equation we discussed for how thick the plate has to be with a given yield stress. Uh, P sub U over B times N is nothing but the stress on the bottom of the plate due to the concrete pushing against the bottom of the plate. And L will be taken as the larger of the two cantilever beams. However big this one is, However long, don't really have that one. This is M. The other one is B or L. Whichever is the longer of the two, that's the one that you'll uh, use. Now, when they do tests on these things, they find out, geez, man, this really is kind of a mess. When you lightly load the column... The whole plate does a pretty good job of being able to stay in compression. But when you really heavily load it, the concrete has a little bit of deformation in it. And this center part of the, of the plate will have a tendency to bend up because of the stresses in here. And you could probably put, fit a piece of paper under there for some short distance. So there's a difference between lightly loaded plates and heavily loaded plates. There's also a difference if you have what they call a small column, a small plate. This is a small plate. It doesn't stick out very far past the uh, column itself. Or a big plate. Well, here's a big plate where there's a whole lot of... In this one, most of the bending is just because this piece right in here is unsupported and you get little short columns in there. But in this one here, the effect of this long column coming here far overpowers it. So there's a difference in your answers for small plates and large plates. And it can get to be a mess. Nobody's really very well defined what the real break point is between small plates and big plates. So what they've really done is they've took, taken a couple of different analyses and they just kind of bunched them up all into a... A uniform, unified theory you know, based on the speed of light or something like that so that you can get the job done and still have reasonable, uh, perfectly safe stresses at a reasonable cost. One of these things was a guy named Murray in 83, and he had the idea that we would take an uh, area similar to what the wide flange itself looks like and then say that those little cantilevers didn't touch out in here and they were so long. Then a later proposal was uh, Thornton, and he proposed an analysis based on two-way bending of the plate between the web and the flanges. Basically, he said, look, theory of elasticity has a solution for the bending stress in this plate. It's a plate that has uniform pressure under it. It is fixed at this line, and ours is because due to symmetry, there's one on both sides. So if you push this down, the plate shouldn't rotate underneath the web because the pressure on this side should be the same as pressure on this side. And pinned along this edge, that makes sense because if you load this plate under pressure on this side and there isn't much on that side, then it would tend to roll like it was unsupported but by a pin. And then this end here is free. I said, okay, where in the world did you get an answer like that? He says, well, it's like I say, it's theory of elasticity. And they tabulate the results so you can get answers for what the stresses are in this plate. There'll be some bending stresses in here because the plate's being raised up. There'll be some bending stresses in here because it's the wall of a cantilever beam. So you go looking around, and sure enough, there's a bunch of books that tabulate this stuff. This is one of the more famous ones that's called Rourke and Young. Here they have the plate we're looking for, 
That's his case seven, but the whole book is full of things like this. Here the edge of the plate is free. Here the edges of the plate are simply supported. That would be where it is underneath the flanges. And here's where it is fixed. And that's because there's another one on the other side. Due to symmetry, this edge can't roll. And the plate is loaded all the way across from the web towards the free edge. And you get these equations and you get these constants that go in there. And so it's pretty much right on the money. If, on the other hand, this thing does pop up a little bit and not any longer touch the concrete, then you wouldn't want to load it. Maybe you only, only want to load it two-thirds of the distance from the web to the end of the load, in which case here are your numbers. Or maybe you load it heavily, so bad that this plate you can see under there. You see things living under there, small bugs. Well, then you probably ought to only load it a third. Or maybe you say, well, why don't we just use a triangular distribution? They have all these answers, and they have many more. So if you run into a case like this for some reason, these are good numbers to use for a specific design. But in our case, I know what they're going to do. They're going to take all those things, and they're going to draw a curve through the middle on the safe side and say, use this, because we just need to get this job done. And fortunately, these are not the most expensive items in town because they're relatively small. So what they've done back on this previous page, they have put, this isn't any different here, 260CD, the next page. Okay. It'll be interesting. We'll see what we can do. Okay, I, it really does just start here. They had something on the pre oh this is from the previous the previous theory. It says now these three approaches were combined by a fourth gentleman and a summary of the results of procedures is followed. The required thickness is same old equation. What Did you find out what page that was on? It ought to be way back in, uh, look in chapter 4. Way back in the beginning of the book. 14-6, page 14. I thought it was in, in chapter 4 somewhere. Somewhere back in, way back in chapter 1, chapter 2. It's not in chapter 16 at all. It would be in chapter 4, maybe 4-16, no? Okay, well, I'll find it. We'll find it. 14-6. Okay, well, I copy. I got... That's correct now. They still got to be in an end because now then they're applying that to everything you do. Plates, beams, you name it. If it sticks out on a plate, that's it. So what page is that? Is that page 14-6? It is on that page. Okay. Maybe the one I showed you before I wrote that down wrong. I don't know now. It's too late. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. Thank you. All right. Now here's what you do. You do, in effect, the same thing. Your L squared now is brought outside. L will be however long you think the cantilever beam is. In our case, L is equal to N minus 0.95D over 2. If it sticks out in one direction, this is out from under the flange. And N is equal to B dimension minus 8 tenths of B sub F. This is if it's bending about the web. And you take the longer of the two. And then it's possible that the little plate theory we were talking about may control the situation, and you have to check and see if it is. There are two, cal three calculations you have to do. Number one, N, and it's going in the same direction, but N prime is equal to D 
V sub F, right out of your column table, dimensions, square root divided by 4. You're going to take the longest of these numbers. Except N prime isn't just this. Really, N is... Uh, where does it go here? I'll find it in a minute. Here we go. You got to look everywhere for these things. Lambda n prime. So here's your n prime that goes right in there. Now then, you correct it with a lambda. Now the lambda correction is all of this other stuff that we showed you before and and drawn a few curves through things. First, lambda is equal to two times square root of x divided by 1 plus square root of 1 minus x, less than 1, where x is. Now then, we're back on solid ground. 4, depth of the beam, width of the flange, depth of the beam, width of the flange, parentheses squared, times. Piece of view, you know what piece of view is. That's how much request you really will put on the column. That isn't how much it will hold. That's how much is really going to be on there. It buckles at half of what it would hold because it's long and slender. You put what you've requested here, not fee times it, but the real full blast load. Take a look on page 260. And then fee of the concrete P sub P. Remember, they have a different symbol. That P sub B is how much the concrete will hold. The concrete will probably really hold 85% of the 28-day compressive strength times the area of the plate or the area of the concrete. That's assuming they're both the same size. Except to be safe, there's a lot of variation in concrete times 0.65. Or if your plate is bigger than, if your, that wouldn't work, if your plate is smaller than your concrete area, if your concrete area is bigger than the plate area, that's a better way to say it, then you get uh, square root of A2 over A1, more load. You've got to be careful because this is limited. When A2 reaches 4 times A1, this effect stops working. So tell me the area of the plate, tell me the area of the concrete that it's sitting on, square root of uh, area of the concrete over area of the plate times A1, again times the strength of the concrete, again times phi for concrete. And that's how much strength you can have out of the concrete. With a limit of 4 over 1, that would be when A2 is 4A1, Square root of 4, square root of 4 is 2, 2 times 0 0.85, 1.7. It's limited to this number. Don't go beyond that number. That's where you get this term right here. This is due to your column request. This is due to your actual concrete strength. So we're having all these numbers, we get x. Who knows what that is? What do you do with x? You put it in here. Who knows what that is? I can do it. Where did it come from? It came from some of the things like out of uh, the Rourke book and uh, some other theory. Now, what do you do with it? Well, number one, they find that lambda is really closely given by this equation. And it goes like this, plot of lambda versus x. And it comes up and it comes up and it goes like that. The truth is the limit is one. It's it's actually a correction. It's like C sub B. In other words, this thing is getting ready to be multiplied times lambda, and it's a correction to how long that cantilever beam really sticks out. So they tell you that the limit on this is a 1. And so they have you do not that. They have you do this. Now, if you say, well, I'm a weenie and I don't understand, raise your hand if that's your case. Okay. One. 
then you can just take lambda as one. I mean, the best thing you're going to get out of this thing is so that in certain instances, this thing won't make you uh, use a thicker plate than you really need to. That would help. That would knock the lambda n prime length down by lambda. So he says it's pretty nice. It works. It's reasonably economical. There's no need to determine whether the plate's large, small, lightly loaded, or heavily loaded. And you can always just take lambda as one if you don't want the correction. But if I come up with a problem where n lambda, if that's a 6 and that's an 8 and n prime is a 10, you better go looking for a lambda. If you get this as a 6 and that's an 8 and n prime comes out 8, you just write down. Don't need a lambda. It's already no worse than anything I already have to take care of. Couldn't resist. I plugged in x and lambda, just an equation in uh, Excel. And sure enough, it looks like that. And in the real world, they really find it looks more like this. So they just let you stop at 1. Here's what the plate looks. Here is the flange pinned. Here's the flange pinned. Here is in this region, the plate is unsupported in the middle, so it bends like a uniformly loaded beam. Back in here, it is jammed tight underneath the web, and therefore it doesn't move up. Here's a top view of where these points are. And here, if you look underneath the plate, this is what you see. A, B, C, D, E, F has moved up. Possibly no contact. Possibly still is in some contact. Regardless, it's uh, acceptable. And back under there, you see those points. That's where the web is. So as an example, we've got a 10 by 49 used as a column. Supported by a concrete pier, as shown. It's an 18 by 18. I went ahead and showed 20 by 20. The reason they're only taking 18 by 18 is they got steel in there, and they don't want me messing with this other dimensions in here. They want that concrete not used for structural use. But they want it in there for fire protection. They want it out there so in case of a fire, when this concrete starts spalling off, you still got the 18 by 18 in the core of the column. Kind of like this on the top. Uh, we just He gives you all the stuff you need. He tells you the strength of the concrete, dead load, live load, A36 base plate, appears 18 by 18. So your load, 1.2, dead plus 1.6, live, is compute the required bearing area. Here's what we did for uh, any kind of plate, whether it's a beam bearing plate or a column base plate. We need to know how much area the concrete will save good enough. Any less area, the concrete gets overstressed. The load piece of nominal, what you and I would call it, they call it, and we got to call it piece of P if we're going to work with their concrete. 0.85 FC prime, 28 day strength. A1 squared A2 over A1 has to be less than this number. It's under the plate, nominal concrete strength. Go see those pages. Equation J82. For P of concrete times P sub P, namely how much it can take, that's your design strength, has to be greater than how much you request. And I'd say that phi for the concrete times Mr. Concrete's opinion of how much load he can take is his nominal strength. It's 0.65. You see how the code changed or the specs changed? 0.65 times 30 days strength for this particular concrete of 3,000 PSI times area 1 times area 2 over area 1. Area 2 is the area of the uh, concrete. Area 1 was the uh, area of the plate. 
Got to be bigger than this number. That's design being greater than the request. Now that tells me I need 137 square inches of concrete. That's a lot less than last year. So if I give him 137 square inches with a 2 inch wide by 50 inch long plate, the concrete's happy. He doesn't care. But, you know, I'm not going to let things hang out like that. Make sure your upper limit's okay, because 137 square inches of concrete may not be right. You've taken the square root of A2 over A1 into account. So you have been asked to carry 349. B1.7 as a limit, FC prime area 1 would be 0.65. 1.7 is your limit times 3 KSI times 137 square inches is what you propose. That concrete would cough up 455 kips of load, which means that this did not control. Had it controlled, then you would find that the concrete could only cough up 300 kips, and you'd have to go back and scratch this out and put the 1.7 in there and tell me how much concrete you need. Same thing could have happened to you back when we were doing the beams. This is the first time we've really seen it checked. Well, I guess we checked it every time. Now then, the plate can't like, look like this. In other words, somehow you're going to have to make the plate at least as big as the column. Doesn't have to be much bigger. Could be perhaps only half inch all the way around, half inch out. That's acceptable. If the concrete's happy with it, then we're happy with it. But that, that wouldn't be happy even if the concrete only needs that much area. Concrete, I mean, the column has to touch the plate everywhere underneath the column. Otherwise, the load and the flanges wouldn't have anywhere to go. So he says you need... Uh, 137 square inches of concrete. Uh, the area, the length times the width of the column, that is a W10 by 49. You go check it. It's got about a 10-inch width on the flanges, and it's about 10 inches deep. So he says the area B sub F times D would be a 10 times 10, just if it's just barely the size of the column, and that's 100. Since that's smaller than how much you forced to give me regardless, then I'm happy with your plate. Your plate will be forced to be bigger than the size of the column. If you have a little squatty column like this, you could hang these out. If you have a long, tall column like this, you could make the plate more in proportion to the size of the wide flange. If you let this plate hang out Another choice for this one could well be where you put a little more hangout here and a little less hangout here so that these little cantilevers aren't quite so long. And that would make the plate a little thinner. And if you got 5,000 of these things running around, then it might be worth, you know, optimizing the size of the plate so that the cantilever hanging out this way is about the same length as the cantilever hanging out that way. Within what you can ask the people to do, uh, you can't ask them for a 10.716 plate that way and an 8.032 plate that way. They're going to tell you to go away. Yes, sir. You really don't. Well, you do. You're going to have to make that stick out a little further. We got we got room for that to happen. In other words, if you said that I really need for the concrete a 10 by 10 column and this a 10 by 10 plate and this is a 10 by 10 column, you're not going to put up with that. You're going to go ahead and make it 11 by 11 or something so that you can so it sticks out a little bit. They always do. Now you don't have to weld this to the plate. It's not that that thing sticks out so you can connect it. Because what they'll do is they'll just put a little angle right here and bolt it to the footing 
and then bolt it to the column, and that'll keep the plate under the column. All right, so back to our calculations. Here are the dimensions of our little cantilever strips. This end, he has proposed, since he needs 137, you take the square root of 137, you get 11.99 by 11.99 or something like that. So why he didn't pick a 12 by 12 column? Don't know. Doesn't matter. Whatever he picked, that's what we're going to show you the analysis for. But a 12 by 12 column would still have hung out on both sides by an inch. We're going to use a 13 inch wide plate. This is 10 inches. So we're going to say that we want the little can the little cantilever beams will hang out 13 inches minus 95% of the distance from there to there. That's the point 95. There's two of them on both sides. It's going to hang out 1.75 inches in this direction. N, on the other hand, is going to be this, but a little deeper than that. It's going to go back to about here. That's 13 inches wide. You're going to subtract 0.8. It's also 10. And then uh, put one cantilever on both sides. 13 minus 8 tenths of B sub F divided by 2. So this will be the one so far. Then, n prime, quarter of square root of 10 times 10, two and a half inches. Therefore, there's no reason to calculate lambda because you already got to have a two and a half. Now then, if this one came out four inches, hanging out four inches, I probably would go for the lambda and see if I couldn't get that cut back down to back around to two and a half. Conservative, just let it be a one. Then you take your max of all the numbers found. So 1.75, 2.5, or 2.5, take the longest one. Now we're ready to see how thick the plate ought to be. Thickness of the plate should be the length, the cantilever hangout, 2 times the 349 piece of U requested, 9 tenths is phi, I thought fee for concrete was 0.65. Oh, well, we're not designing the concrete now, are we? We already made Mr. Concrete happy. What we're doing now is we are working with a steel plate. The 13 by 13 plate, 36 KSI, 0.893. You're going to go ahead and make it an inch thick. If you look on page 1-8, I hope that number is right. I can copy it down wrong. You'll see plate thicknesses. They tell you the proper uh, dimensions for plates or what is expected up to, I don't remember, maybe three-eighths of an inch. You can specify them in sixteenths of an inch, and they're on the shelf. Past that, they're every, I don't know, who knows, eighth of an inch. Past that is every whatever. Couldn't resist for us. Here was X, four baker, B sub F, four dog baker flange squared times our uh, ultimate divided by the capacity of the concrete. Four times 10 times 10 over 10 plus 10 squared times there was your request. Here was your capacity of the concrete. I calculated that here. By the time I wrote down P sub uh, fee, piece of P, I realized I didn't know that yet. Here was how much the concrete would be happy with. 0.65, factor, uh, resistance factor, 0.85 FC prime, 28 day strength, A1 times square root of A2 over area 1. Area 2 is the concrete, area 1 is the steel. Concrete's bigger than the steel. 13 by 13 is the steel. Crank that out. Concrete's good for 388 kips before it'll have problems. Now, it says 349.6 from earlier on page 260H, 8H, but the plate size has changed. Back when you got that 349 capacity of the concrete, that's when you were working on a different plate. Since it's gone up to 13 by 13, 
That's a new capacity. Here's your X, uh, plugged in right here, 0.901. Here's your lambda, plug in the X, and you get 1.44 times 1. Well, if, I wish I hadn't even asked. He's going to make me make the dang plate even long, thicker. But I don't have to do that because I get to stop at 1. So it's still 2.5 inches. But there are the calculations if you're curious. I mean, there's nothing to them. Curious, uh, should you be able to do that? Because I'll give you a plate where due to N prime, that rascal comes out longer than the other two. Oh, pop quiz. Just make up pop quiz, but it wouldn't be for today. 36 steel. What is the required thickness of the plate if you put 600 pounds per square inch underneath the plate? Should be able to do that. And this is where your text covered what we covered. These various methods by Murray, Thornton, that stuff, Rourke, got a solution for that one. Here's the problem we just worked. All right. Uh... Grades range from a 30 to a 100. I don't think anybody's dead. But you're going to have to do less texting and more listening. I got them alphabetic. Guess who gets up first? I just saw him. Where's a car? Okay, I'll call your name out, A-C-A-R. Oh, there he is. You know, I don't remember. Uh, I just recorded him in there. If you'll email me, I'll be glad to return the email with that to everybody else. So I'm looking for A's. Come on forward and pick up your quiz. Ejimeli, not here. If you don't say here or something. Barry should already be up here. We're in the B's. C's ought to be coming up. Bowman. Bowman, not here. Bowman's here. Boucher. Braun. Braun, not here. Kyle's the C's ought to be up here. Calzado. Cantu. Cantu's not here. Tantu's here. Kerrigan. Carrington. Casey. Chung. Clark. Clark. Chung's not here. Chung's not here. You jerk. Chung's not here. Clark. Cook. Cook's not here? Okay, I'm going to call your name. If you don't say here, I'm going to put it in a stack. You'll have to wait. Curtis. D's ought to be here. Where's Davila? Where's Euless? Euless not here? See, now I know why I got all these 30s. Euless is not here? But you're Forrester. Fulton. Forrester. Fulton. I don't know. I don't think so. Graham, get, 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 get off my stage, get off my stage. Graham, Gamble, Dirk, uh, Mr. Who, who is here? Hilbig, nobody got two quizzes, did they? Hardy, I mean, I may have mispronounced your name, I can hardly read some of them. Hardy, a oh, Hardy, Johnson, right here, not only here, but right here. Koontz. Koontz not here? Leon. Not here? 
Lahog. Mitchell. Where are my other M's? No, none of the other M's are here. Come on up here. Mace. Where are the N's? No N's are here. Nebel. Bees. Perkins. Reinhardt. Reeves. Raymond. Rots. What comes after R? S. Savoy. Steinhubbel. Stevens. Saduki. Triska. Triska here. Tidwell. Taborga. Thompson. Vickers. Vickers? Not here. Vickers is here. Wiley. And Zapata. <laughs> You're always last. Estes. I had all the quizzes. I called Estes. Oh, did you? Uh, either that or I called Jones by mistake, but it looks like Estes. Sorry. Quizzes. Now, that's a good way to get in trouble. Thank you. Grades are not cast in stone. Quiz is posted. Go make sure that you know why you got counted off before you come and ask anything about it. Or you will really look dumb. Uh, this isn't about the quiz. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm actually a pledge for Chi Epsilon. Oh, this, sure. Yeah, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind signing I'd up. love to. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You bet. You too.